This episode is sponsored by MJ's Progress Not Perfection Meeting Center Association. We are in our meeting center where we do all these meetings for mental health and addiction. I can do this podcast anywhere. I can do this at home. I can do this in a closet. I can do this in a basement. It doesn't matter. All I need is somebody else to talk to about addiction and recovery. What I can't do from anywhere is help people with their addiction and their mental health problems. So if you can help out, you know, we do have a Venmo, we have a Cash App, we have a PayPal, we have an address you can send a check to. And, you know, all the money that gets donated goes towards rent, goes towards keeping the lights on, and goes towards keeping the internet on. So please, you know, if you can get five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, it doesn't matter. Anything you can is so appreciated. And if you are a local business, if you're a national business, whatever, and you wanna be a part of what we're doing, you know, you can reach out to me and we can talk about how you can be a sponsor. But I'll let you get back to the episode. Welcome to the show, man. Um, you know, we're gonna keep identity hush hush, but I do know you. You know, you and I go back three and a half years when I showed up, not even when I showed up to LA, when I showed up to meetings. And, um, you know, one of the meetings I used to go to, we used to chat it up outside a lot and we got to know each other and, you know, it turned out we were both, you know, Jersey boys and now getting recovery in LA. Um, that was three and a half years ago. Did you ever relapse since then? Yeah, there was, a uh, uh, two, there was two relapses actually. Um, you know, once, you know, like I, I made a, a, a pretty good group of friends over at that meeting. Um, but, but what ended up happening was I really relied on that meeting to, to be like my safe place. And, and what I, what I started to see was that, uh, uh, a lot of the people who were going to that meeting were, were out of towners who were getting shuffled in on the buses and stuff, like all the guys our age. And so, you know, you guys would move away and stuff. And, and, yeah. um, I, you know, I started losing uh touch with, you know, a lot of the, uh, the Half that room, that room was a huge room that was yeah. always filled. People standing at the walls cause it was so right. filled. But yeah. to your to your credit, the druggy buggies were dropping us all off. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Like Dauphine limousine, druggy buggy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they were dropping us off in like just packs. So packs, it was 50 percent capacity was L.A. residents living there. But if you take them out, it's e it's probably even 70, 30 with 70 percent being rehab people going there for a meeting because it's not giving anything away by saying it was a Saturday night meeting. But still, you know, they made it, they make sure we went to it. And um, there's 300 meetings a week in LA. Try pinpointing that one. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah, man, like, you know, once I can see, you know, people that, because you were, you had like six months, I think, when I met you. Yeah. Yeah. And I relapsed too. So the relapse, it happens, dude. We're sitting right. here sober talking about it. Yeah. You know, what is your new, what's your new sober date? We'll get to the relapses. What's your new sober date? July 4th, 20, uh, 2020, July 4th, 4th of July, man. Yeah. Oh, no. So it's been over a year now. Congrats, dude. Thanks, dude. Yeah. yeah now, no. what was it, what was going on that July 4th that you're like, all right, I'm back in. So, all right, dude, I had this one final reservation, right? And, and COVID was happening. Uh, I came back in, right? Uh, after just a gnarly run dude with fucking the whole spectrum of opiates man and and uh you know it was uh you know the fentanyl pressed pills that are all over the place and and you know the black tar is so huge we can talk about that right we're, we're yeah cool. oh yeah dude you can okay, curse right. you can talk about all the yeah and cool. it's and just want to make sure yeah and to your credit too like when you go, like, from what I'm talking to everybody, a lot of people, when they have that relapse, it's like, it can be a gnarly relapse, like you said, because, you know, you weren't fucking with fentanyl pressed pills back in the day. Right. Let's be real. Yeah. So now, not only are you relapsing, but you're just relapsing and then going in overdrive to the next oh, shit. Oh, yeah, dude. And, so, because uh, at that point, once you relapse, you got the fuck it's completely, because you're just like, well, what else is going to happen to me? I'm already right. out. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, man. So, so I came back around and, uh, what ended up happening was, you know, I, I lost my job. And so I just decided to just focus on just, just meetings, dude. And, and AA and, um, you know, just like we know, man, the, the desperation starts to wear off and, and COVID happened. I moved in with my girl and, you know, we were, it was, there was so much uncertainty, dude, all the meetings that I was going to, 
were completely shut down. People were going yeah. on Zoom. But I wasn't, I dude, I wasn't spiritually prepared at all. And I thought yeah. I was, dude. And I thought like living with my girl was gonna like, you know, make it all right. Like we, you know, out. everyone's kind of like going stagnant. And and um around June of 2020, I uh I just got the fuck it's this one day, dude. So hard, it was so sunny out, and, and I knew this guy who had a prescription that he was purchasing from another dude. And there is, these are all dudes in the rooms, you know what I mean? So yeah. let's just throw that. These are how I knew these guys. Cause I was rolling around with them and they were speaking at meetings and all that shit. And, uh, behind the scenes, one dude was getting a script of, uh, thirties, man, like OG perk thirties. And, uh, yeah, he was Roxy, selling, Roxy's Roxy's brother. Yeah. And, uh, he was selling them to someone else. And, and, uh, that dude was holding on to him and I knew he was kind of low key about it. So I was like, yo, man, like, let me just grab a few of those and I'm going to move them to a few other people. Give me a really low price and I'll probably be able to clear that script from you and you'll be able to make a bunch of money. And I used my little sales tactics, you know, and showed him how much money you could make if we just, you know, sell them for this price and da, 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 da. And, and really what I was doing was I was just doing them all. And so yeah. I was grabbing them and I was doing them. And obviously, you know, one turns into two, turn turns into three and and uh, man, I'm just like full in the grips of that mental obsession you talk about, dude. That allergy comes out, and and uh, I, I couldn't. That choice. Oh yeah, dude. And yeah, and, so and, that one. and I already know that, dude. Like I thrived with the steps, man, and I and I yeah. live an amazing life today with the steps. And I life beyond my wildest dreams, even though shit hits a fan. It's still I did not expect what I have, and I'm so grateful for that. However. I know for a damn fact, especially those blues, those thirties, Roxy's, whatever the fuck you want to call them, John's. John's as soon as dude. I was, that, that's what, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, did, you, did you call them where you live too? John's and Jimmy's, yeah. dude. Okay, Jimmy's, dude. I said Jay's. I said John's Jay's. and Jay's. Yeah, so dude, as soon as I already know, as soon as if I was to taste it in the back of my throat through snorting it, it's a wrap. I was, you know, that drip, everything about it it's a wrap and my mind like i can talk about it in a way that's romanticizing it without wanting it because right. i do this for a living now you know what i mean like i literally talk about my past openly every single day with people that are pretty much strangers or just like you where i'm catching up and we're just getting to know each other more because we couldn't even talk like this then yeah. you know so like I, I feel a lot comfortable talking about it so candidly because I have it right in front of me by doing this. Now, right. I would never try to talk romanticizing sniffing pills or anything like that if I was by myself in a bad place talking to one other person because that's a relapse. That's, that's me yeah. heading towards a relapse. That's yeah. me talking myself into it. This is you and I talking about a bad relationship we had and comparing how our girlfriends treated us. And right. our girlfriend right. at this point was Roxy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, I mean, that's that's the thing is we can look back at relationships and find good, but then it's good to also point out the bad so we don't fall back into those oh, relationships. Yeah, but yeah, I can taste it, man. I can taste it. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes when I sniff hard enough, like I have a stuffy nose and I give it a, I can still kind of taste it a little, <laughs> you know? It's been three that's and a half funny. years. And I can still feel like I taste it a little, but yeah. yeah, like it's one of those things. I don't trust myself. I know once I do one, it's over and I'm going to want them all. Cause that mental obsession just grips a hold. And when I relapsed with drinking it, it didn't take me to Oxy. Luckily I yeah, got really great, lucky, man. but like watching dope sick, I was able to get through it without getting like triggered. Really. I got triggered one time, but that was about it you know and that's yeah. because michael keaton's a great actor you know and yeah. he, he sniffed an 80 and the way he sat back was so like heavy that i felt the heaviness of him sitting back from that coffee table onto the couch you know and i was like oh i i felt that one you know like that Dude, was a yeah man i hear it even uh even when they they like you 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 see the dude who's a problem drinker or whatever and they crack open a beer and they toss the cap onto the table and you hear that like clink 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 and dude, I can hear, I can, I, I feel that one, man, getting off of work, dude, a humid ass night in Jersey and just coming home. First thing I'm doing before I'm even taking my work clothes off 
is is clink 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 you know and hearing yep. it on the table and you know and, and then going upstairs and showering with the beer and then yeah I mean, for me it was twisted tea because you know i'm really manly but yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> Yeah, I love it, dude. Yeah, exactly, it was, dude. Yeah. It, it was that it was all of it. And, you know, well, let's get into that history because I don't really know much about your history, dude. You yeah, know, man. Um, yeah, so dude. I know we're both from Jersey. You know what I mean? Right. Now, um, when did you get into like drinking and drugs? Because like for me, it was like 11, 12, walking around town, you know, right. putting vodka in the Gatorade and all of that. Yeah, dude, the clap, man, I think that it's uh, um it's pretty classic Jersey, dude. You know, like you're, you know, it's, it's like, dude, it's, there's not really too much to do, but summer's popping like in the neighborhood, in the town, because like everyone wants to be out, dude. Everyone wants to wear yep. their shorts, you know, everyone like, dude, it's like the cold is oppressive in Jersey and uh, you know, the daytime in, in the summer is pretty oppressive, but then you hit that sweet spot around like six thirty seven on a, on a summer night. And and, uh, yeah, man, I remember riding my bicycle around, dude. And like, you know, some of the older kids would have some beer and stuff. And, and so I was already like introduced because the older kids were kind of my mentor. My dad was living in LA already. And so, you know, what the older kids were doing seemed to be okay because I always followed their footsteps anyway. And, uh, when I was 14, you know, obviously my space was really big and my space was Dude, I, I, I didn't think about this till recently. I was so influenced by what was happening on MySpace, and I was hanging out at the mall a lot. And so the Are older you my age? How old are you? I'm 29. Oh, okay. So you got in on the tail end of MySpace. Yeah, I, I was okay. using MySpace uh, 12 years old, 13 years old. 14. Okay, that makes sense. Because yeah. I, I was, I'm 35, and I, right. I, remember, I remember MySpace. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, there was okay. a lot of people your age bro let's just say people your age were influencing me over the internet the internet community was strong people were putting those trippy photos up you know those those pictures of like that like animated weed posters and shit yeah and i was like yo man like what's up with these dudes they look kind of like the california skaters that i like but like they have something else going on that like seems to make them look so chill and relaxed and and, uh, you know, I was interested in like alternative types of music and stuff. I really didn't like the mainstream and, and, um, no, you know, Jersey, I I've like... already talked about this multiple times now, but if you were into like the music scene in Jersey in the two thousands, it was usually pop punk. I, I, uh, was kind of on the tail end of pop punk. Okay. Like, yeah. And, uh, it, like I got more into like, um, more into that like Cali reggae scene, like the 311, slightly stupid. They were going yep. over to Festival Pier over in yep. Philly, and we were hanging out in Philly. And so, like the older kids, they were smoking weed. And when I was in eighth grade, when I was 14, I I, uh, I wanted to smoke weed with some of my friends' older brothers, you know, and those guys. And and they would all smoke pot and chill out and eat some cookies. And I was like, dude, I want to see what this is like. I don't, you know, I. I I wanted, I want to feel, I want to experience a different feeling. And, and right when I started smoking bud, I loved it. And we, we use the internet to, to hunt down, uh, we, we researched different types of drugs on the internet. And, and then we would find people in town who were, uh, you know, who, who supposedly had them. And we'd find one person who's older brother who like connected with the college kid or the so-called college kid, you know, the college age dude. And, we would uh we would get some psychedelics and and you know we were drinking on the weekends and that's kind of what high school looked like for me you know I sold pot in high school and and uh, I loved it I couldn't stop smoking it for the life of me man but just like we know dude the um it it moves quickly like the voices dude like all that insecurity all that like unsettled feelings all that stuff that we're like chasing uh our like our initial drugs for starts to come back after a while, you know, and so we seek stronger drugs. And by the time I was 22, I was kind of, you know, I was, dude, I was completely confused with where my life was going. I wasn't doing too well in community college. Like I had this, this little job managing this little uh, restaurant. And, um, you know, I had a, a handful of roommates who were older, they were around your age, you know, and, and, um, they, they, dude, they, we would drink, man. We would drink so heavily, but uh, drinking so heavily was making me emotional at that point, dude. And smoking weed wasn't doing it for me, you know, and, and other drugs weren't really day-to-day -day drugs, you know what I mean? But, yeah. but then 
people had blues, dude. And uh, I got into them uh, a little bit more on the tail end around 2014. I jumped oh, in okay. blues, dude. And, um, and they were already $25, $30 a piece. You know, the good times were over where everyone fucking had them. You know, it was just it was just blues, dude. And there was only a few people who still had them. Everyone else moved on to dope. And uh, man, the first time I did one, dude, I I did sit back, dude. I did have that sit back moment. And I got home from work, dude. And I would, you know, I would uh, uh, say what's up to my roommates. They were already drinking. They were already partying, getting ready to go to the bars. And I would go upstairs, dude. They knew I needed a shower. So I'd shower, dude, to do an oxy and just lay back on my bed and kick it. And I would go downstairs and drink a beer or two. And then we would go to the bar and I would wake up the next morning with no hangover. We would drink so heavily. And I didn't get a hangover because I was on painkillers, dude. And, yeah. and, you know, it was a, it was like a miracle, dude. It was like, oh, my God, like, here's my miracle drug. I can go to work and uh, repeat this process over and over again. And, and by that by that spring, dude, I was fucking I was by by it was 420. I remember I was like just on the cusp of getting addicted. And, and I had a bunch of people over for a 420 party. And and um I ran over to my dealer's house, dude. I grabbed a bunch of them. I came back and we just smoked weed all day. And like people getting loaded in my crib and like the, the way that we would drink and, and smoke weed and, and uh, party made it really easy for me to cover up the fact that I was doing oxys, dude. No yeah, because knows. when you have that party house, you can kind of like get away with shit because you're supposed to always be fucked up because you're the one that's throwing all the like parties. Yeah. Why wouldn't you look destroyed right. all the time? Right. And I, I was that I, I had, I was the first one out of my friends to like have my own place. That was like a party place. Yeah. And I was like 1920 way right. too. <laughs> and yeah, by the time I, and that was the problem though, is because I drank so hard at 19 and 20 and 21 with all my friends that by the time 22 came around, same as you, by the time 22 comes around, I'm not excited to go to the bar anymore, bro. I'm not excited to catch one of the specials. It's not fun anymore. It's not doing anything for me. Yeah. It's not working anymore. So what happens when things don't work anymore for us? We either quit it or we up our game. Yeah. You know, so that's when I found, you know, well, first it was school buses. Then it was, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you ca you called them school buses too, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, dude. School we were just buses. talking about that too with somebody funny, else. The school yeah. buses and bananas. Bananas, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. but there's little green ones too, dude. Little K pins that had a minty taste when you snored them. I don't know if you were even supposed to be snoring them, but <laughs> it, like, dude, like the mucous membranes don't really absorb like benzos the same way that like no, uh, it's you know, but they had a minty taste, so we we're like. Yeah, if you were if you were gonna practice harm reduction, I'll practice harm reduction right now. If you're gonna sniff Xanax, you're wasting your time. Yeah, just yeah. eat it. Just eat it, please. Yeah. It's a waste of your fucking nostril to be sniffing Xanax. Right. right. Uh, I did it, but only because I was literally trying to catch a certain effect with mixing it with oxy with Roxy's yeah. and cocaine. Right. So like I was literally making a giant line of everything. So that's different, you know. But like if you're gonna do it, just eat it be responsible don't eat more you don't need 20 of them <laughs> right. i promise you they're gonna kick in just eat one and relax they're, it's gonna word, kick in <laughs> word, of advice, word of advice to anyone who's listening who uh isn't done yet <laughs> yeah well i mean i do practice harm reduction man i preach harm reduction i think it's important yeah, to tell people it's okay that you fucked up it's okay that you're still out there it's okay that you're not ready yet just right. be careful because people are dying because of like fentanyl, let's just straight up, I'm blaming fentanyl. They are dying left and right. You know, uh, March 2019 to March 2020, there was 78,000 overdoses. Yeah. March 2020 to April 2021 broke 100,000. Yeah, know? I just read that. I just read yeah. that. Really and right. 70, I think it was like 80,000 of that 100 were fentanyl. Yeah. 80% had Not fentanyl. Really. That's yeah. crazy. So imagine how many people, and then that's not even considering all the people that were saved by Narcan. I know, yeah, dude. Can you, oh my God, man. We just yeah. actually uh, uh, at the the local spot, dude. I'm, I think you went there a bunch of times. Um, you know, just the, the local the local yep. meeting hall, and and um, 
you know, they, they, uh, they just revived someone in the parking lot two weeks ago. Like when they shot him with, I think they, uh, my buddy said it was six, uh, uh, Narcan fucking not nasal sprays, six of them, dude. Like, and, and they didn't know what to do. They were like, yo, we don't like know what to do. So they just kept spraying him. Like, are you talking about the spot by the beach or the yeah. spot or the uh, spot or no, 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 no. The spot like across from the 99 cent store. Yeah. The 99 cent store burned down, dude. Did it really? Was yeah. it that, was it that place that you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. In that parking lot, that parking yeah. lot the size of my studio. I know. It's if tiny. it's like two cars. Yeah. <laughs> and well, plus, you know what? I'm not even surprised though. Like I remember, you know, sitting in a meeting before and this dude comes walking out of the bathroom, goes crisscross applesauce in front of the podium, looks yeah. up at the dude and shares that he just shit, smoked meth in the bathroom. He doesn't know how to stop. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, that dude, meeting it, was wild. <laughs> that's a good spot to be uh, like, you know, for me, man, it's a good place. You know, this is really what I'll say about it. It's uh, that that was the first meeting I ever went to. And the moment I went there, dude, it changed my life. I heard a I heard a clear message around enough knuckleheads, dude, that were just like me at the time that I was able to believe that this actually does work for people. I had a faith. I had faith that it worked for others. So there was a little bit of belief that it could work for me when I went there. And it really started changing for me at that specific place when I started attending late nights. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I, when I was able to get, I got granted permission from my sober living to break curfew seven days a week to go to late night there. Yeah. And um, that changed my life because I was hearing real shares now. Right. Like when you go to nooners and you go to eight o'clock meetings, it's all well and good. It's some great recovery still. However, a lot of the times, especially in LA, majority of the crowd, like we already talked about, is from a rehab. You know, they're they're fresh and they're new. They got less than 30 days. They don't have any recovery to talk about. All they have is war stories to talk about. War stories can be good, but they're not going to keep me sober. Right. So when I go to late night, there's nobody there from sober living because they're breaking curfew. There's nobody there yeah. from rehabs because, it's cur you know, so I'm sitting there with people who want to be there and they're all my age because it's late night and they all want to be there. Right. Yeah, there's like four there was like three or four that were court ordered to be there because i used to sign the slips <laughs> and that was right, one of my right. commitments was to sign the slip yeah. so i know there was like three or four that had to be there but there was always like 30 40 of us there you know and it was yeah. always like a fun time so right. like that kind of shit keeps people sober dude a hundred percent and the other thing that uh I, I like to talk about about that room specifically is it's a safe haven for people who are still getting loaded but want to stop and yeah. dude that's one of dude man i can't tell you how many meetings i went to loaded you know and dude you know what we're allowed to be in there one of our traditions is the desire, desire to stop, dude. That's all we need. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop. So, dude, these guys and these gals, they're welcome there, bro. And and I get to see it front and center, bro. I get to see how gnarly it is, dude, from an outside perspective now. I get to yeah. look right in the face, man. And, it, it, dude, it helps me so much, you know? Like, it's, it's important to see that. It's important to talk to them. It's important to offer help. It's important to interact. Ask them their story. You know what I mean? Sometimes I like I go to, I go to small meetings because I'm in the middle of nowhere, yeah. and there's only two of us sometimes, dude. Yeah. And whenever someone shows up and they're just here to have a meeting and just me waiting for somebody, then right. I basically do what I do on here and ask them about their history, ask them about their usage, ask them about their drinking, and let them talk for the first time because a lot of times – we start when we get sober we don't know we're allowed to talk like we can right? right like you start saying things and you're like you have a lot of reservations like oh shit they're gonna think i'm fucking crazy i can't say that yet okay i'll say this and then the more you go to meetings and you hear people share and you're like oh i can say that oh okay i can say that all right i'm just bear my soul and i'm gonna feel a lot better because when you hold shit in that's when resentments start coming up yeah yeah so it's yeah. important to just be honest that's yeah, it's man. saving my life, you know, yeah, this time dude. around. So yeah. yeah, you're you're on a okay. Now we'll now we'll jump back now. Now yes. you're back to Jersey, right? And you're snorting thirties, right? And, and it's like 2014. 
Yeah, dude. I think it was just 2015. We had this blowout New Year's party, man. Everyone dressed up in suit and ties, dude. We brought the glass table up to my bedroom and, and uh, you know, everyone's, you know, huffing out chachi, dude. Everyone's doing blow, you know, all that shit. I think there might have been a nitrous tank. I can't remember. One of my roommates was a welder, dude. And you know how the Philly boys are, man. And, yep. and uh, what so, did you do that? Did you do like only 130 that night just so you wouldn't get sick and this way you could do I a bunch of I don't even know if I did a 30 that night, right? Uh, this might have been right before I was really into them, but I remember doing them a little bit and then coming out to California, hang out with my dad. I smoked a bunch of weed and I came home and I started doing 30s more recreationally like every weekend and uh and then next thing you know it's like spring like we were talking about and uh by that point man it was getting gnarly and i had some friends who were going to music festivals dude like friends i grew up with went to high school with and i was kind of like trying to stray away from those guys because they weren't interested in bettering their life but what they were interested in doing is making a lot of money. And they were going to music festivals all over the East Coast and the Midwest. And they were moving ketamine, dude. Like <laughs> large quantities of ketamine from New York. One of them, quantities. one of them fr friends with a dentist? No, dude. They have, <laughs> yeah, they have an overseas connection. And so they were going into New York to people who were in an organization who were were working in over we're working with overseas connections and those those uh asian mega labs and they were oh, getting shit yeah dude and so they were they were picking up birds of it man this birds of k and then we had another dude who was owned a strip club in philly and he owned like all these little like shady businesses and he knew a chemist for mdma so we would get these two drugs dude and and um we would get the test kits, you know, like the, the bunk police has test kits. I don't know. Uh, Rave safe, I think sells them as well. And, and we would test drugs in front of people at these music festivals and blow their minds with the purity of these drugs. And so we would sell massive amounts, dude, all over the, uh, I, I, I left my job. I wasn't planning on going back to school. I was planning on just hitting the road, dude, and traveling around and, and uh, coming back for like maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and then getting ready for Thursday and then going back on the road for music festivals. And, and um, during those three days, I had a, plenty of money in my pocket. My roommate was moving fucking oxys at the time. And uh, so I was just blowing all my money that I was making on oxys and recovering, quote unquote, from this gnarly fucking like six day run, dude, on these music festivals these parties in the mud, the rain, fucking barely eating. I would come home for three days, recover, and then I would bring as many as I could, dude, to the music festivals with me. You and go then, to Bonnaroo at all? We didn't go to Bonnaroo. I didn't make it down there. Uh, we were Electric Forest and uh, Gathering the Vibes. and. Uh, um, uh, I was just curious. I just, that's the first one I think of yeah. in the springtime. It's like summer. Right. It's like June right. in Tennessee right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, no, I didn't get down there, but, you know, there was a bunch that I was going to, and we were part of this, like, nation, this, like, nationwide hustle that was going around, dude. Like, it, there's kids from all over the country doing this, and, and uh, when I, when I came home, and, and my friend, my friend gets arrested, dude, in Wisconsin, and it's gnarly, and we had to bail him out, and we lost everything we had there, and when I came home, dude, people didn't want to fuck with us anymore, because we just got in this huge uh problem with the courts and shit and are you there are you frozen yeah oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, look frozen man He's yeah fucking... <laughs> and, anyway crazy. so when when i came home dude we were broken dude and i was beat the fuck up i had no money left and no connections wanted to mess with us so we were kind of like you know out of it dude like they didn't they didn't want us to be going to they didn't want us involved anymore and and word got out right in these communities that what happened and no one really wanted to mess with us and so our hustle was gone, but I still had this thirst, dude, for fucking opiates, man. And, and, um, I didn't have the money. Like I had a few weeks earlier. And yeah. so, so yeah, I started messing around with a little bit of dope. And then, uh, I had an opportunity to go down to Atlanta and I believe that New Jersey was my problem at this point. 
I believe that, you know, you don't see laughed a little bit, dude, because that's what we truly believe, dude. Like I lived in North Carolina, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, California, New Jersey, yeah. 30 different fucking addresses in 15 yeah, years of running. Right. I get it. It's amazing, dude. Like we really think that like that's the environment. That's the issue. And the environment might have a little bit to play into it, man. But like, dude, we can cultivate fucking, dude, we can cultivate something beautiful or something d- destructive in any environment we go into. And so I moved down to Atlanta and the first thing I'm doing down there, dude, is, uh, 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 you know, get, getting loaded, dude. And, and, uh, I lost a few job opportunities and I started to Uber around Atlanta, um, because I just couldn't get it together. And, and uh, I knew a fucking connect for oxys. And, and then next thing I know, I do what any good addict does. And I, I, uh, I pay a crackhead down uh, by the stadiums to bring me to a trap house and uh, hook me up with their connect. And that only costs $5. These are crackheads, you know, and we know how gnarly that fucking drug is. And, and so all I had to do was pay this dude five bucks and he fucking hook me up with a, a, a really reliable connect. And uh, uh, I, Fucking you're so much you're smarter than me buddy i'll give you that when i went to north carolina i didn't think of that either i didn't think of it or i didn't want to think of it i was right. like i lived near the hood in durham too yeah. i could have probably but instead i was paying people to ship them to me yeah to, from dude. from new jersey to north carolina right. and I'm, I'm waiting on that you know waiting on a package from if people <laughs> If people think waiting on Amazon is rough, wait until it's USPS and there's like 40 pills inside where you already prepaid a thousand dollars for. Yeah, you dude. know what I mean? Like, and you've been waiting all weekend long for them to show up. And then turns out you refresh the app and then it says they're in Alabama because they missed the act, they missed the fucking oh, shipment man. and they had to turn them all the way back and they came the next day. Oh, God, dude. I was, oh yeah, my God. Like, yeah. And it, yeah, it's, so I get it. So <laughs> You know, eventually, so. <laughs> man, I was I was out there, dude, living without electricity, dude. I was just scraping by like twenty dollars at a time, and and uh, you know, I actually I spent a, a Christmas, dude, with like no food, and and I didn't want to tell my family what was going on. I didn't know what I didn't, dude. I couldn't. I didn't understand like really like that. Like what was going on with me was was more than like yo, like this is a punitive thing. Like I was like I can't tell anyone about this because you know like what's gonna happen you know like and so i'm yeah. at, i'm in atlanta dude it's christmas i'm completely alone dude and the only thing i have is is some dope and a few days later man the electricity turns off and uh i finally made a call to my father dude because i burned so much i dude, i just fucked over my mom so much and i barely had a relationship with my dad and i was like dude i need i need a change of pace man i need to change my life and he comes out dude we drive my car uh with everything i could pack into it to California. And a few months later, um, you know, I'm in rehab, you know, I, I, he has, he's had all these surgeries and, uh, he had like this whole shoe box underneath his bed, dude, of just all types of different painkillers. And I just ate him up, dude, and snored him, dude, so quick, bro. You know, like it was, he was blown away, dude. He had such a surplus that dude, cause they were just giving him different prescriptions and he was yeah. like, all right, I'm just going to put them somewhere. Like maybe I need them in the future, you know? And and uh, he just had this huge fucking shoebox, dude. Like, just filled, bro, like 10 different scripts, dude. And then in his closet, he had a fucking huge jar of Valium, dude. He must have had 300 Valium that he was just, like, sitting on. Because they kept giving him prescriptions, right? And he was never eating them all up because he's not one of us. So yeah. he didn't know what to do with them. So he was kind of, like, just, like, taking the prescription that he had and keeping it like, you know, at his, his bedside and then taking the rest of the leftover pills and putting them in this fucking jar, dude, and just leaving it in his closet just in case he needed another surgery or just in case things got bad. Yeah. I mean, they, they crack down pretty hard on uh, people and prescriptions these days. So I don't know. It was his rainy day fund. And um, I don't, it's none of my business why he had so many of them. But I found that, and and there was a, a a huge quantity of Norco's in there too, uh, the um the the Perk Fives, and and like just tons of them. So I was eating eight of them the minute I wake up. I was eating four Valium the minute I wake up, and repeating the process at noon and repeating the process at night. And uh, dude, they they caught on, man, really quickly. And I I go to rehab, and then 
you know, I'm in sober living. I, uh, uh, I relapse, dude. And then I get into a new sober living. And uh, somewhere around that time is when you and I met. I started taking a little bit more seriously, but I didn't really have an experience with the steps yet. And so, you know, I, I go out kind of like what we were talking about when we first started, I go out, I come back around, uh, you know, I go out again, dude. And, and, um, um, when he says you know, go and, out, he means relapse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. I'm yeah. relapsing, dude. I'm in California at this point and I'm kind of like in and out of AA, you know, and in and out of 12 step recovery and, uh, in and out of sober livings. And, uh, finally, you know, I, uh, um, COVID happens, like we were talking about, I relapsed for this final time, and I'm in this hotel room, dude, my girlfriend who I was living with kicked me out, she was tired. This episode is sponsored by MJ's Progress Not Perfection Meeting Center Association. We are in our meeting center where we do all these meetings for mental health and addiction. I can do this podcast anywhere. I can do this at home. I can do this in a closet. I can do this in a basement. It doesn't matter. All I need is somebody else to talk to about addiction and recovery. What I can't do from anywhere is help people with their addiction and their mental health problems. So if you can help out, you know, we do have a Venmo, we have a Cash App, we have a PayPal, we have an address you can send a check to. And, you know, all the money that gets donated goes towards rent, goes towards keeping the lights on, and goes towards keeping the internet on. So please, you know, if you can get five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, it doesn't matter. Anything you can is so appreciated. And if you are a local business, if you're a national business, whatever, and you want to be a part of what we're doing, you know, you can reach out to me and we can talk about how you can be a sponsor. But I'll let you get back to the episode. Part of this shit, you know, see me get six months, see me get eight months, uh, relapsing on her, you know. And I knew, dude, that I knew it was over with, dude. And uh, I was supposed to be moving in with this dude who had a really cheap room for me, this old surf head. And um, he was a really cool guy, but he was sober and he was like, he heard that I relapsed and he's like, yo, you can't live here. Um, and so I was kind of like just in this hotel room and I, and I came to this moment where I was like, man, I'm just going to keep being a loser. Not in the sense of like, yo, you're a fucking loser, but in the sense of like, yo, I'm going to keep losing everything. Cause that's what keeps happening. I have nothing here. I have a bicycle and a backpack with some clothes. Everything I own is at my girlfriend's house or in a storage unit. And uh, I have nowhere to put any of it, dude. I have nowhere to put anything. I have no, I have nothing, no idea what to do. So I call up my old sober living that I lived at, um, and and I and I always had a good relationship with the guy, and and I moved in there, man. And and uh, I I got linked up with a really serious sponsor, and dude, we went through the steps every single morning at seven o'clock in the morning. I would jump out of bed to his phone fucking ringing, dude, and I'd be on that phone right out in the backyard. And then after that, dude, I'd start exercising. And I just started with 10 pound weights, dude. I was so, I was so frail and uh, COVID. So it wasn't like I was getting any exercise anyway. And I'm just yeah. 10 pound weights. And, and I had a little bit of money in my pocket. So I, uh, I, I used that money to buy fucking really nutritious food and, and multivitamins and, and started really taking care of myself from the inside out. And uh, the outside in both, dude, I was doing both, man. And um, I got really into like exercising and really into like, you know, this step work and, and uh, you know, there's no meeting. So me and this dude from the house were driving an hour, dude, to North Hollywood for this fucking little tiny meeting with these crotchety old timers. And it was amazing, dude. And that's really what like it looks like for the first couple months. And then I got set up with a, a, a really great job. Like it kind of came out of nowhere. It was a God shot. And, and I, I just sent my resume to this dude and, and I got into a really professional company and I was able to work at home, um, which was amazing. Yeah. So it's working in this sober living dude on a computer all day. And, and then uh, that leads us to the holidays, man, you know, and, and here I am fucking heartbroken, dude. Right. Like, uh, uh, and I'm in this sober living and it's the holidays, you know, and, and I, this was kind of the topic we were trying to reach at. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, so this, yeah, this was this Christmas last year. Right. Yeah. Dude, this was this Christmas last year. And, and mind yeah. you, I had a girlfriend for the last few years. And so we were doing Thanksgiving, we were doing Christmas, New Year's, we were doing all the holidays together, birthdays, all of it. And, and, um, so dude, I was, I was nervous when the holidays came around and uh man thanksgiving dude we uh 
we we cooked bro like the the guy one of the dudes in the house one of the older guys who's going through a divorce man he was he was he didn't have any relationship with his family they all like excommunicated him and um man he was just like go with god go with the steps go with meetings and go with service and so i kind of followed suit and i watched this dude wake up at one in the morning dude to get that turkey in the oven for thanksgiving and i watched him sweat all day long in this kitchen dude to feed 20 dudes maybe 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 there's 12 dudes in the house at this point you know Mm -hmm. and and, uh, uh he spent all day doing it and i was so amazed man i was like dude i want to help any way i can and uh and and dude this guy and we grew so close man this older guy and uh we're still close to this day i love him like a brother i just gave him a cake for three years and um so christmas comes around right and i'm thinking dude i'm i'm alone like here's poor pity me like i'm i'm gonna be i'm fucking heartbroken like da 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 so you know what i decided to do i'm like well, first, dude, I'm going to get some cards, right? I'm going to get some cards from the dollar store, and I'm going to write a card to every single treatment center, every fucking rehab or sober living that I've been to, dude, and I'm going to thank them. I'm going to write a card and say, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, thank you for everything you've done, you know? And, awesome. and that was the first thing I did. It felt good, dude, right? Yeah, that's li- right- literally living in gratitude. Dude, straight up, man. I had yeah. no other idea what to do. Me and this guy, Nick, man, we, we, uh, we decide to take it a step further and, um, we, we go out this one day and, and we write a list of the people in the house who have been there for a while, who, who, uh, really mean a lot to us. And we're like, yo, we're going to get them some gifts. Right. And, and, and from that dude, I realized, man, I'm not just getting gifts for a few people in the house who mean a lot to me. I'm going to get something for every single person in this house even if it's just a, a, a coffee mug or a yeah. box of chocolates or like a little, like I was getting those Lindor truffles for people, you know, and uh, it's a great gift. Everyone loves those. Yeah. Chocolates. It's the, it's the go-to. Like it's for $3, quick, dude. Yeah. You can buy fucking three, three during the holidays. They're selling three for $9 at, at a uh, uh, target. So yep. I mean, I just decided to write a list on my iPhone, dude. I wrote a list of every single person in this house. And then I, I made a list. I was checking it twice, dude. And I made sure that if next to everyone's name that we bought them something. And uh, Nick bought half the gifts. I bought half the gifts. And I, I went into my bedroom, right? And my uh, my roommate, uh, uh, it was a two-bedroom, right? And and my roommate was already gone. He, he lived, his family's in Santa Barbara. So I just got this wrapping paper from the dollar store, right? A thing of tape from the dollar store and a pair of scissors from the dollar store. $3 for fucking gift supplies, man cards from the dollar store dude 20 cards for a fucking dollar you know and dude i yeah. probably spent like a hundred dollars right all together maybe less dude not much money at all and uh i decided man every single person on christmas day is gonna have something to unwrap these dudes man i think i'm in a shit situation but a lot of these dudes man they're middle-aged guys they really tore their fucking life to the grounds they have crazy amounts of debt they have crazy amounts of people who hate them they burned so many bridges, dude. Like I'm going to, yeah. and all these young guys who never really experienced AA before who probably still have problems with their families. Right. Yep. I'm going to, everyone's going to have something to unwrap on Christmas day. And man, I put on a Christmas movie on my computer, right? I put it full screen. I turned that shit up loud and I started wrapping up these gifts, dude. Right. On Christmas Eve, I'm wrapping up all these gifts. Christmas morning comes around, dude. Instead of feeling fucking sad, bro, I felt so excited to go downstairs with this big ass bag of gifts and yeah. put it on the fucking uh, 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 the fireplace mantle. All these gifts, and my my sober living, the owner, he had gift cards for Starbucks for everyone. So dude, these dudes all had all tons of gifts, man. Yeah. And I couldn't have said further than that, dude. I texted every single person I possibly could. Merry Christmas, happy holidays. Hope you're having a wonderful day. I just spread as much cheer as I possibly could because I was in such a dark place. And and bro, by the end of that night, dude, by Christmas night, man, I felt so good. Yeah. I felt so fucking good, dude. <clears throat> People don't realize like that's all you have to really do to like get out of your head is to, you know, concentrate on how to make other people happy. Yeah. Like like you know if that makes like um I remember when I was grieving for the first time in sobriety, like I didn't know how to grieve, even like this was like a death that had happened 
six years before, but I never grieved any death sober, you know? So whether it was a, a death in front of me that just happened or a death that happened years ago, I never grieved death sober. So um, I was I was going through it. I was in, it was like 40 some days, you know, at this point where I, you know, was clean and sober. Right. So I was really like still on the edge. And um, my sponsor had me call up his sisters and talk to them and ask them how they're doing and only talk to them about them. Ask them about them. Don't bring up your problems. Ask them about them. And you're going to feel a lot better. And sure as shit, it, it was exactly what I needed was to reach out to them. Yeah. You know, see how they're doing. They need to hear from me too. So, <clears throat> yeah, getting out of your head is such an important thing. Um, now, when you got done Christmas, how, how has, because this is the most time you've accumulated then. Yeah, dude. So, you know how how has your life been now that you've been accumulating more and more time because that was in a rough patch you know four or five months in now cut to right. a year later you know how are you doing what's up well man you know i i think dude i did learn a valuable lesson that uh holiday season what we call the bermuda triangle thanksgiving christmas uh uh new year's you know and and what i learned man is is uh i can dude i can make it through some really hard times sober it's it's so possible it's so e it's not that it's easy it's just like what you were saying it's a very simple concept that a lot of people don't do and that's being of service to other people dude and it's not man there's so many ways to do it there's thousands of ways to be of service it's not like you know and, and um so so uh you know i i stayed in that sober living for a while i continued the job and then when i was ready dude i moved out and then uh I moved into a great apartment and, and the minute dude, I moved into this apartment, bro. I, I was nervous, dude. I'm like, yo, I have my own space for once, dude. I, my own safety net that I haven't had in fucking years, dude. Yeah. Like I, man, when I was in Jersey, dude, I had gnarly roommates, dude. Half of them were fucking drinking and partying. The other half was doing oxys. It was a fucking trap house. Like, and then in, in, in fucking Atlanta, dude, I was a fucking junkie. I was a danger to myself. And, out here, I've been in and out of sober livings and in and out of rehabs and in like in my girlfriend's place. And I had an apartment with some awful roommates. And, Were and you in Venice? I feel like I you was, might. Yeah, dude, I was like, uh, um, had, I, I worked on the boardwalk. So I had all my belongings in like a duffel bag and I had it in the shop that I worked at. And uh, I was couch surfing. I never slept outside, but I was couch surfing all over the place. And Stayed in hostels and stay, you know, and for a couple okay, weeks. Okay, that makes there, sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, not fully like in a not, tent. Yeah, you know, not like in a tent, tent city. Technically, skid row. Dude, technically, yeah, I've been uh kind of like in and out of homelessness for fucking years now. And I mean, unless you consider a sober living your actual home, Residence. I don't know. If, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't know what that. I don't, I don't know because I thought about that myself. Right. You know what I mean? Because there's some people that live in the sober livings for like a year. Yeah, dude. Like, do they go to the DMV and get their address changed? You know, like, I don't know. I don't know how that works. But then again, and then again, if you're homeless, like in New York City, like there's a big homeless population in New York City. Right. Um, but also it is against the law to not have a photo ID in New York City yeah. ever since 9-11. It's like a law to have photo ID at all times. Right. So... What address do they put? Yeah, dude. <laughs> like that's a dude. That's a conversation for a different day that we've seen firsthand because of. I'm supposed their... to talk to somebody from Manhattan tonight when we hang up, and right. he's like two weeks clean from methadone, oh. and he, every time he posts, he's always walking around the city. Yeah. So I'll have to ask him, yeah, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll have to get yeah, back man. to you. No, there's a, a, a seriously, there's a huge social uh, uh, dilemma or social injustice that we're facing because what happens if you lose your birth certificate and you lose your passport, how are you going to get an ID that states where you're from? You yeah. know, and like, I know, I know and, a homeless dude in my town where I live that doesn't have his birth certificate. He can't find it. He right. can't find his social security card. He has no idea where it is or he yeah. has no identification whatsoever. So, and he's getting arrested all the time for sleeping in laundry mats. Right. And, um, you know, he just, I'm like, dude, you have to, you can't get a job 
until you get your birth certificate because they're right. going to need something. And yeah. I was like, you got to go to the and he's he has a lot of mental, you know, we deal with mental health issues here. Right. Sure. Not just not just addiction. We talk to people for both. So yeah. I'm trying to give him like <laughs> some good orderly direction, um, but some direction on how to, you know, get a birth certificate again. How to get a new social. I was like, you have to go down to the county that you were born and go to the courthouse that you were uh, the county you were born in. Get get a they have a copy of a birth certificate. They'll send you out a new one. Then with that, then you'll get a social card, a new social security card to go to social security. So like I'm trying to give him all like the direction on what he needs to do, right? But then the problem is is the follow through because he's unmedicated yeah. and with mental health issues. So, you know, yeah. I can't babysit and walk him right. around town all day. I I just can't. Yeah, but yeah, it's a shame, man. When you're homeless, like, and you lose that shit, you're really like up against it because you go to get a place to live, show ID. You need, you know, um, and a hotel for the night, an apartment, even a job. You need an ID to show. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Unless you get some shady under the table shit, but then he won't be able to get an apartment because it won't be showing income. Right. It's yeah, man. It's a it's a brutal reality that we face. And dude, I was in that cycle, bro. Like, and um, yeah, man. Like that that shit's haunting, dude. And luckily, I had my stepmom and my father who like were able to like you know help me out a little bit. But bro, like when I couldn't find my um my birth certificate and I couldn't find I lost my wallet, dude, in sober living, and and I couldn't. I, I couldn't find my fucking social security card or my passport. They were buried in storage, but I thought they were lost because of my fucking antics out in, in California. And, and I just was like, well, how do I fucking do this? Because like, there's no way to like work around this shit. Like, because when you try to apply for a passport, they need a fucking ID, dude. When you try to fucking yep. apply for your social security card, they need a passport. Like, so I'm kind of in this ring of fire where I'm like, dude, like I can't figure this out. And luckily I was able to get my birth certificate and, and solve all that whole time last year, dude. Like I, I got through it so gracefully and like, it's so smooth. And like, I'm, I'm like so excited to like write those Christmas cards again this year, dude, for, for those people, you know, like, dude, it's kind of a yeah. stressful time of year, bro. Like, but, you know, I'm inviting my my dad and my stepmom and my girlfriend over here for Thanksgiving. And it's going to be the four of us. And and I'm excited to cook, dude. I I, I went out with my girl yesterday to go Christmas shopping at Target. I, I, I enjoy doing that shit. And I was like, I'm not really going to get a tree. I don't really need a tree. Like, it's, you know, like, mm. my apartment's good. But, but uh, dude, I fell in the hype, man, and was like, you know what, dude? I'm going to buy a three-foot tree. It's $25. What's $25, dude? A fucking... Yeah, a, a, a hoagie and a and a and yep. a, a, a couple Red Bulls. Like, <laughs> dude, I I was like, yo, man, I'm getting a little tree, right? I'm putting a little bit of lights on it, and and I'm gonna have a little tree over here. And it's I don't need like a big tree. I mean, I'm a bachelor. I have you know an a, a apartment with another dude, but yeah, but, you know, but like having a little something that I can build and put up myself, you know, and put on a Christmas movie. And dude, like I can get into the spirit. Exactly, myself, dude, and feel a part of in my own little way, and um, that's so, I was, <laughs> dude. I was so resistant to that, man, for so long, and I see other alcohol. I see other people, dude, who are up against the same thing that we're up against, being resistant to that stuff, dude. And I, I'll tell you, man, it does feel good, dude. It it really does feel good to celebrate the holidays in my own way, the way I'm able to. You know, well, and, change is uncomfortable, right? <clears throat> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, change is uncomfortable, and people don't like different things. People don't like to try new things a lot. <clears throat> they're they're afraid. People, what we fear the most is the unknown. So if we're changing and evolving into something that we don't know or understand, it's a very fearful thing. Even if it can be a very positive thing, it still doesn't mean it's not fearful. Yo, can I build off of that for a second? Please. Because what you asked me and we, we dude, I, you're such a good friend of mine, man. I have such a connection to you just because of like, you know, Everything. like, yeah. dude, it, I have such a connection to you, bro. It's like, I, it's like, I haven't really spoken to you in so long, but like, I'm, it's like, I'm talking to one of my close friends right now and you just understand, you get it, dude. And, and, uh, 
you so we we diverted dude i'm diverting right now like we we kind of or we digressed we digressed so much and um you asked me how am i staying sober now dude like what am i doing that's working for me and you know what i decided when i first came back in and i started getting physically healthy again it didn't take all that long opiates is a pretty it's a pretty quick one dude without methadone or anything like that you can you know, you can, you can kind of bounce back in 30 days, dude, physically. Uh, you you know, really like, can. You really, and I, dude. and I'm proof of it, dude. I was yeah. walking around five, six miles of LA at, at, at 30, I got out of, sober, of detox or inpatient 28 days. And at day 29, I started walking to meetings all the time, all over Culver city and yeah. Marina and Santa Monica all over. And, um, so I lost like 75 pounds you yeah. know what I mean? Like I was walking all over. Like I felt the best I've ever felt in my life um, right. because I was the opiate addict, like Chris Farley. Right. I was the one that gained weight. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. the one that was all made and I wasn't eating either. People are like, Oh, were you eating a lot? It's like, no, I was retaining fucking water. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. doing pills all day and not pissing and not shitting. So right. what happens? You, it stays in. <laughs> yeah. Dude, your body. Oh. Absorbs, it's yeah. Yeah. Man. So dude, to, to, to bounce off of what you're saying right now, man, um, and, and to bounce off that question on how I'm staying sober, I made a decision, dude, somewhere within those first few weeks, man, to do as much shit as I could that will be as uncomfortable as possible, dude, because I know none of it is going to fucking kill me, right? So I just started being as uncomfortable as I possibly could, dude. I'm saying, man, I was so, dude, like I, I was skin and bone, dude. You know, I've always been a thin dude, but I was fucking yeah. skin and bone. And I decided, man, you know what, dude, just like the steps, just like day-to-day -day sobriety, I have to start somewhere. And I just started picking up those 10 pound weights, dude, every morning. Right. And those 10 pound weights soon turned to 20 pound weights. You know, that fucking bench press that was only the bar soon turned into a 65 pound bench press, soon turned into a 120 bench press, you know, soon turned into, you know, so on and so forth. All these things with, with with working out and exercising, cooking, dude, going to the grocery store. I'm going to learn how to cook some different meals for myself. What feels good in my stomach, dude? What feels good when I wake up in the morning? You know, what, what yeah. am I going to do? And it's uncomfortable, dude. It's not easy going like, to the What are you putting people. into your body? Because what you're yeah, putting into dude. your body affects your mind. Right. It affects 100%. your body. Like, that was what I was talking to Kev about last night. He went vegan recently. Yeah. And it changed everything for him. Like, he was like, dude, I was so against. I'm like, vegans are pussies, blah, blah, blah. I can't do that. And then, you know, my girl's vegan. And I kind of saw what she was doing. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. And then we watched Game Changer. And I really wanted, like, <clears throat> but yeah, he's like, I drink alkaline water and yeah, I'm vegan yeah. now. And he's like, I, I've never felt better inside. Right. He did something. And this is, dude, this is the whole point of this, man. He did something that was so uncomfortable to do and so against his belief system, but he decided to try it out. Right. And so I, same shit, dude, I just started trying, dude, it was not easy going to the grocery store and trying to figure out how I'm going to cook. What am I going to cook with? Like, what am I going to eat? Like broccoli and Brussels sprouts and, and greens, dude? Like, are you kidding me? And then what I found is it actually tastes really good. And the better it <laughs> makes my body feel, the better it tastes. Yep. Right. I'm like, man, I'm eating nothing but nutrition right now. This feels great. And it was uncomfortable, dude. And so when I left that sober living and I had a few skill, I had a few tools underneath my belt that apply to the real world, you know, or not that apply outside the rooms and a bunch of tools that apply inside the rooms. I moved out, dude. And, and I was, I was uncomfortable. I felt like I was going to have a panic attack, dude. I was in, a, I was, and I was fear ridden, dude, that first couple days, man. And the first thing I decided to do was call some people who also successfully moved out of sober livings and tell them how I felt, dude. I got honest with them. It was uncomfortable telling them, yo, bro, I feel kind of, a, I feel kind of afraid of myself now that I'm in a long-term living situation on my own. You know, I feel yeah. a little bit uncomfortable. I feel a little bit scared. They said, yo, man, here's what you're going to do. Make more calls, go to more meetings, plug into your neighborhood. And that's what I did, dude. I plugged in, bro. And, 
And uh, as I was doing that, dude, I I stopped working out in the backyard of that sober living and started going to LA Fitness, which was uncomfortable for me because there's a lot of big dudes in there. There's a lot mm-hmm. of really good looking Hollywood people. Um, but what ended up happening was I found comfort in going to the gym and being a part of that group. And then when I realized dude, it was too far for me to drive, right? We have a gym in my apartment complex, but I'm uncomfortable because dude, the people in my, my neighbors are going to see me working out, dude, here I am self-conscious again. And yeah. I said, dude, this is the same thing that you experienced when you first got into sober living, same thing you experienced when you started going to the actual gym when you grew out of the gym in the backyard and you're going to have to experience it again. Dude. You're going to have to experience more uncomfortable moments in your life to grow from them. And so dude, the reason I bring that up is because I just kept doing other things. Those are like just two minuscule things I was doing, man, you know, but I had to just keep getting uncomfortable, learn how to go to a new grocery store. Oh my God, God forbid, dude, my schedule and my structure of how I shop, dude, is, is thrown off, man, you know, and, and dude, it was uncomfortable, bro. Everything I've had to do, dude, has been uncomfortable until I found comfort in it, you know? Yeah, and, uh, exactly. It's about it's, just sitting in the shit sometimes. Dude, it just... <laughs> Dude, not just sitting through it, but fucking learning how to fucking breathe in it, bro. Yeah. And fucking learning how to climb through it, dude, and clean yourself off. And and uh, man, dude, like I, I have been able to cultivate a nice little life for myself over here. And and um, I don't wake up really with the, um, the obsession to use, dude. That shit's been lifted. Now I wake up with new obsessions, dude. And yes. new fears, dude. My fears aren't getting loaded today or how am I going to scramble $20? My fears are for with with work and, and with, with real world situations and yep. how am I, you know, like, what am I going to do to be able to uh, uh, purchase a home one day? And and this is emotional sobriety that we're up against now, man, is, yeah. is, is these new fears. Fears on like, how am I going to fucking cook a turkey properly, dude? right? Like what, what do I need to purchase and what do I need to tell other people to purchase so that we can cook a proper Thanksgiving dinner together? Yeah. It's the real stuff. Like it's the stuff that most people have to deal with and the most fears that people just have to deal with, with or without drugs or alcohol anyway. So it's time for us to learn how to do it as well. We just suck at it, dude. You know, we're just like so bad at like breaking the habits even if we're sober, dude, like a lot of us are just yeah. like, oh my, and that's why I kind of like make fun of myself. And I'm like, oh my God, God forbid, like I, I have to go to a new grocery store. I'll drive 30 minutes out of my way to go to the same grocery store I always go to because I know where the chicken's going to be. I know where the rice is going to be. I like it's, it is so fucking silly, dude. And I did that. It, well, last night I, I broke my rule and I went to the closer one and I didn't know where anything was only because I felt like I didn't have enough gas to get to the other one. <laughs> like I was like, oh man, I could really, if I go to Giant. I'll probably be faster in there because I know where everything is. But yeah. I don't know if I have the gas for Giant and back. I don't feel like getting gas right now. I'm just going to go to this grocery store because it's closer and right. just figure it the fuck out when I walk through the aisles. Dude, and and that's that's really what we're up against, man. We're just walking through the aisles of life, you know, yep. and we're just figuring it out and, like, seeing what works for us. And, and, dude, if it doesn't work, man, we can go back in sobriety. You know, we can go back to what does work. You know, yeah, if, it's okay I, that it doesn't work. Right, dude. If it's, if it's, I told someone this, they kept fucking saying how uncomfortable they felt at a certain meeting. They were like, I feel, and they were like crying in a chair over at our spot, dude, down uh, by the dollar yeah. store. And they were crying. And I went up to them at the end of that meeting. And I said, look, you are welcomed here. You know, if you don't feel welcome somewhere else and you keep forcing yourself to go over there and it's not working for you and it's, it's, it's making you feel less than or making you feel like you don't belong. Don't go over there anymore. You don't have to, you don't have to always push yourself to the limit of uncomfortability. You don't have to do that. You, you know, if, if it, if it works and you try something new and it feels great, wonderful. But if you try it a couple of times and it's not working for you, you're, you're, it. Yeah, like just, you know, let bygones be bygones. Step away, dude. It's the same thing with certain people. I was talking on a panel the other day or uh, about a month ago. uh, And man, panels are great, dude. You know, talking to these dudes and these rehabs, these sober livings, they they love it. And uh, 
he was asking about resentments and asking about fourth steps and 10 steps. And, and I said, look, like you're going to be up against a lot of different characters in these rehabs, a lot of different personalities. And more than likely there's going to be someone that you are not going to be able to get along with, or they're not going to be able to get along with you, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many fourth steps you do, no matter how many 10 steps you do, you can write inventory for the rest of your fucking life. Maybe this person and you aren't going to be friends. And the best thing I said to you, the best advice, dude, is to just, you know, wipe your hands, dude, you know, put them up and say, yo, I surrender. This is not a friendship I'm ever going to be able to gain. You know, yeah. it, it's causing too much pain. Let's just yeah. walk away and let bygones be bygones. Yeah, you don't know? do what I did in rehab when you don't like somebody. <laughs> I, there was a dude in my rehab that I did not like because he was very misogynistic and he talked down to the women in there. Yeah. And he was like 50 and he was coming off crank and he used to play in the majors like baseball. Like he's a big fucking dude. Right. Um, but at this point, he wasn't anywhere close to being a professional athlete. He was 20 years out from being a professional athlete, right. you know, easily. Um, but still, he was at one point a big fucking dude. And he was pissing me off the shit he was saying, how he was talking to the counselors and the other women. And so I just waited for him to be watching TV. And I knew he was going through psychosis. And I would take the other remote control from the girl side. And I would turn the volume all the way up on him and turn the volume all the way down, turn the TV off, change the channels. And he thought he was going through psychosis and he was freaking the fuck out. And my therapist had some choice words for me. He yeah. still, I, I never told him it was me. I just told my therapist that I did it. Right. right. I said, I was really upset with him. She goes, did you confront him? I said, no, I took the remote and I fucked with him. <laughs> and I told her what I did. She was like, JD. And I was like, yeah, that's what I did. She's like, you going to apologize to him? I said, not yet. I'm not, I'm not there. Like I, it was like two weeks sober. Right. You know what I mean? Like I was barely, I wasn't even working any kind of program at that point. Yeah, dude. dude. I was just all angsty fucking, you know, it was just angst. New yeah, sober man. angst. And, so. and dude, in some situations, bro, there's just going to be people that we just don't get along with. And like yeah. we can learn from ourselves, from those people, from a distance, you know, like I don't yeah. have to, that's a big thing I've learned, dude since like trying to get sober is I don't have to be friends with everyone. I don't have to get along with everyone, but I, I have to be able to sit in the same room with people, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, man, that's a valuable lesson, dude, with, with your, whatever your professions, you know, whatever, whoever's listening to like their professions and, and uh, you know, how, how they operate with their family. There might be a family member that you just never get along with, dude, who's never going to understand you. And you might never understand them. But if you can learn how to just sit in the room with them civilly, you know, and um, and not react, just respond to them, you know, like my, my uncle was blown away, dude, when I told him I don't drink, mm -hmm. you know, he brought up like shit from like my childhood and like my shit from like my teenage years, my early college yeah. years. And I was like, no, like, I, I mean, look, I just I just don't drink anymore. And he was like, I can't understand that. I mean, I know like da 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 da. And I was like, yeah, it's just best that I don't. You know, like instead of being like, well, I'm a fucking alcoholic and, and I'm I'm physically allergic to to alcohol and I break out in an abnormal reaction and go into that whole thing. I'm like, look, I just, you know, like I, I, I you don't need I, to tell your uncle that you break out in handcuffs somewhere down. the <laughs> Exactly. Somewhere <laughs> down the road, I learned how to be a lot more responsive and a lot less reactionary. Yeah, yeah that's and, a, and that uh, is it's about patience. It's yeah. literally about taking a beat in your mind before you respond, right? right. And it, cause it's so important because while you're taking that beat, if you're face-to-face -face with somebody, they're usually reading your reaction anyway. So it's important to just be, you know, genuine with what you're going to say. But I find that, um, what do I, what was I going to say? Procrastination is how I'm patient now. Yeah. I'm putting everything off. You know what I mean? Like whether it's something that's in my head that's going to fuck with me. I'm like, I, I'm going to deal with that tomorrow. I procrastinate sometimes in order to be patient to let things work themselves out. Because if I don't procrastinate certain things, I don't, then I'm not letting things run their course. And sometimes things need to run their course. As bad as it looks and as bad as it gets, they run their course, things lift, and dust settles, it's better. Just be patient. It's when you push and try to make something and force something out of, you know, an organic situation like um even relationships you know like 
a lot of relationships are going to be organic and they're going to happen right away. And some are going to be slow progression. And you might know like, oh, this is the one I can marry, though. And this is the one. And but it's slow progressing because they're not ready yet. You can't force them to be ready. You have to be patient. So you have to be patient in your head, because if you're forcing somebody and pushing somebody out loud, then they're going to walk away from you and you're going to ruin everything. Yeah. We're, so, we're, yeah. You know, you have to learn patience. And a lot of us addicts, when we get sober, just because we're not, you know, doing drugs doesn't mean we're not patient. We're like, we still have a lot of the problems that we had. We just need to learn how to deal with them differently. Right. Yeah. We're, uh, we're, we're not God, dude. We need to stop playing God. We're, we're, yeah. we're the actors, dude. He's the director. And, yep. and, uh, so yeah, man, with, like in these situations, dude, where I'm trying to control somebody else and how they view me, dude, and, and try to get along with this person who just doesn't like me at all. And I don't like them because they don't like me. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. dude, like, why am I playing God in this situation? It's exhausting. Like, and it's, 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 it's not needed right and, um, and it, it goes back to that that uh that selfishness dude where like i'm being yeah. so selfish in this situation because like i am not considering what this person's going through how they are how they operate their operating system is built completely different than mine and here i am trying to fucking get them on my level yeah you know? i'm trying to and, talk to them like i'm talking to myself it's not gonna right. work right <clears throat> dude. it's like um, not yet it's it's not going to work. No, dude. But yeah, being patient is so key. I mean, just yeah. talking to people, being, you know, talking to anybody, having a support system, you know, like you're like undercover today with this and it's only for work purposes. Like you're out there, man. You're talking, you have a support team, you have people in your life that you can talk to. You, got, you Obviously you and I are good friends and we can talk about whatever this shit. So like, that's the important thing to like tell people is this time of year, reach out don't let it hurt inside if you internalize that hurt and don't reach out for help it's going to hurt you Dude, it is going to affect you absolutely write some fucking christmas cards go to the dollar store and buy some christmas cards i'm telling you you will change people literally like how many rehabs how many sober livings have we gone through dude how many of them get fucking christmas cards dude how many yeah. are they getting you know what i mean like dude they've helped so many people they reach they helped reshape us a lot of the time man what it's funny because I, I i i don't i didn't send out cards i sent out text right. to my old therapist and the old director of my rehab and um the other director there was like two different directors and one of them actually did my podcast because she's one of us yeah um she's got seven eight years sober you probably seen her around well pacific palisades was her home group um yeah. but yeah she was on my podcast a few months ago and i got to thank her literally got to look in her eyes well kind of on right. here and be like thank you for what you yeah. did for me right. you know i got to send those texts out and my therapist got back to me and she's like i don't get these texts often Dude. from the fo the follow-up of the like don't worry i'm still good i'm here and i'm married and i'm happy and thank you so much you were instrumental and like you know those Dude, those holidays. And it was like, it was like, no, but this wasn't even a holiday, bro. This is what, it was random. This was like a, yeah, yeah, August, <laughs> you right. know. But yeah, especially the holidays where people are looking at their phones more. We're not going out. It gets darker at five. It, it's, it's depressing. It is literally seasonal depression season, like through and through any which way you cut it. People oh, yeah. are grieving loved ones that aren't here anymore for the holidays. COVID just went rampant and took a lot of loved ones. Overdoses went rampant and took a lot of loved ones. A lot of people are grieving. Reach the yeah, fuck dude. out. Hit a yeah. meeting. There's plenty of meetings. I got a meeting that I got to hop off on. I got a meeting in a little bit, but I got to unlock the doors and make the coffee and shit. But like, hit a meeting. Hit a meeting. Talk to people. You don't, even if you're still getting high or getting drunk and you want to stop, go there and just don't share and listen. You might hear yourself talking. I'll tell you, dude, I, I went to holiday meetings, right? And there's nobody there except for like two people. One of the dudes was homeless. And uh, we we set up the meeting, dude. We read we read the format and we went through that meeting. And and bro, I'm telling you, dude, when I left that meeting, I cried. Um I I was not alone. 
you know, I felt alone, but I wasn't. There was other people who were in the same situation as me at that moment who needed to be there. And I got to be there for them and they got to be there for me. So don't give yourself this fucking excuse. Oh, there's no one going to be at the meeting. There's only going to be three people. One of those three people might change your life, dude. You yeah. Know, you change their life. If you need it, dude, it's there for you. You know, it's available. Reach out, get uncomfortable, you know, like don't sit in your own shit you know, like, fuck it, don't do it, just, you know, like, yeah. reach out, like, it, and my DMs are open all the time on our Facebook page, the MJ's Progress Not Perfection page, like, if you go to that page, it literally says very responsive to messages, because we're answering messages all the time on there, you're doing you know? a beautiful thing here, bro, I can't thank you enough, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful, man, what you're doing, dude, and to see you in this light, and, and see the person you've become, you know, it, I mean, you've always been a, a, a dude with a huge heart, a, a loving, caring person, a, a real friend, you know, so it it's just beautiful, man, getting to see you do this stuff. Thanks, you know, buddy. I can't thank you enough for having me come on today. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. You know, I'm, I'm just trying, dude, you know, oh, I, lived, I lived my addiction one day at a time. Now I'm living my recovery one day at a time. Beautiful. You know, so beautiful. that's all I can fucking do is... This helps me stay sober more than it probably helps most people stay sober, you know? <laughs> so yeah. thank you, too, because this is the kind of shit that I need every day to keep me sober, these kind of conversations, whether they're with strangers or with people I haven't seen in a couple of years. This is the kind of shit that keeps me sober. Yeah. So, man. you know, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, I'll hit you up when it's out. Uh, I'm going to hit NA right now. And, yeah, man, thank you again so much, dude. Thanks for opening up the way you did and, you know, talking about everything you did. Hey, thank you, JD. This was a great, this is great, man. I, I can't thank you enough once again. And, and yeah, man, th these, uh, these one alcoholic or one addict talking to another dude, this is how we do it, man. This is yep. how we stay sober. And, uh, That's how it started, know, I, bro. I, I hope you have a wonderful meeting, dude. That's what I'll leave you with. Thanks buddy. You too, man. Have a nice Thanksgiving next week, buddy. Okay. You too. Happy holidays. Talk Thanks. You, you too, man. I'll talk Bye, to you. Man.